Aloha. You're listening to Martin Denny on CJAM on 91.5. Good. So, uh, did you have a nice Christmas? Yes, how was your Christmas? Oh, just nice. How's the weather in uh, Hawaii? Well, we've been having a lot of rain these last four or five days. Overcast, but the sun came up this came out this afternoon and hope it stays up there. A lot of the tourists have been unhappy, uh, expecting good weather and uh, what you know it. I mean, it's uh, been overcast and raining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's like about five degrees here. Oh. <laughs> you know, I've been here. It's all over the country. It's uh, real weird. Yeah, it's been really cold. Yeah. Hey, this is uh. David Warmbier from C Jam, and we're speaking to uh, Mr. Martin Denny. Hello. Hello. This is Martin Denny speaking to you from his home in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, let me ask you, just just in regards to some background uh, information, um, what was your first album? What year did that come out? Our first album was called Exotica, and it was released in 1957, in May of 1957. How many albums have you recorded all together? Approximately 38 albums, and quite a few singles. How did how did you get started uh, playing? What What's like, the, the background in regards to how the band started? Well, the band, the, the, my group originated in, uh, in Honolulu, and in 1955, I, uh, I formed my first group, which was only a trio, and we played at the Dagger Bar at, down the Beachcombers on the beach at Waikiki. And uh, Arthur Lyman uh, played vibes and stand-up drums, and, uh, and uh, then John Kramer, who is now an account ex executive with Prudential Beach, uh, uh, played the bass and myself on piano. And before the year was over, we added uh, Augie Cologne, and he's the one that plays the bongos and congas and Latin effects, and there's the bird call. And that's how the group originally started, it was in 1955. Okay. Um, so, so you were always based in Hawaii? Well, I've lived in, as of this coming January 1st, I will have resided, I've had residence in the islands for, uh, uh, it'll be uh, 37 years. And this is a typical music question, but where do you draw your influences? What were some of your influences when you first started? Well, when I first started the group, uh, we were, I, I hadn't developed a style, and uh, so we used uh, George Shearing arrangements from his books. And he had these one, two, and three, uh, and some of the great standards that he had uh, recorded, you know, like September in the Rain, Roses in Picardy, and... Uh, Things, and uh, there'll never be another you, and things of that sort. We sounded more George Shearing than George did. <laughs> and that was our uh, our initial uh, beginning when we played uh, at, at Donna Beachcombers. And it wasn't until we left and I opened the shell bar at the Hawaiian Village that I started to develop my own style. But basically, I always use the vibes, and a lot of people associate us with the sound, the fact that George Shearing also used vibes. Uh, I just want to ask you, just like Jesse, where were you born? I was born in New York City, and then we, my family moved to Chicago when I was quite young, and then we moved to uh, California in 19, my goodness, 1928, and uh, I didn't come to the islands until 1954. How did you end up on the island? Well, I, I was uh, offered a contract by Donna Beachcomber. Uh, to come over and play the piano at his uh, dagger bar. I had a six-month contract. And so uh, I had never been to Hawaii, and I, I had done a lot of traveling prior to that, and I thought, well, this would be real neat. And so I went over there, and uh, I spent about seven months and then went back home and decided I had liked so much I came back again before the year was over, and uh, that was it. And... Uh, so I opened at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel in 1955. I was playing, uh, just playing piano. And then I had an offer from Donna Beachcomber to come back again to his place, which was right across the street from the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. And that's when I formed the trio, which was very, 
successful because uh, it was a neat sound, and uh, we used to get a lot of the uh, the, the uh, service people would come in from the from the different services: the Navy, the Army, the Air Forces, and the Marines, and we we developed a terrific following. Well, um, down the beach combers. Was, was Don an actual person, and that Don the Beachcomber is a oh yeah, a uh, bar. His real name was Don Beach. <laughs> uh, he spelled the D O N N, and he passed away a year ago uh, at the age of 82. But uh, he was the originator of the original Don the Beachcombers, which was established and uh, that he first started in uh, on the mainland in California in Hollywood, and then eventually they opened in Chicago and and uh, Palm Springs and Las Vegas and, and of course his, his watering place was, was very famous and everybody who's who and at one time uh, passed through those doors. And, and you played there for a period of time and then you went Well, on. after I, uh, I left in 1950, I was there in 1955, in 1956 I went over uh, and I opened the shell bar at the Henry J. Kaiser's Hawaiian Village. And I spent a year there until 1957, and that's when I made my first tour on the mainland. And uh, uh, after about about six months on, on the road, I, I uh, had an offer from Don to return there back again, and so I came back with the group and opened again at uh, Don the Beachcomber. I'm just curious, what would... Do you know what your best-selling album was? Well, obviously, the uh, Exotica was number one on the charts for 13 successive weeks. And uh, I had as many as three albums going at a time at, when I was hot, which was about in 1958, 59, and 1960. And uh, my, my albums were in great demand at that time. But my, my single, which was taken from my first album, Exotica, was called Clyde Village. And that earned me a gold record. It sold over a million singles. In regards to the instrumentation that you use later on, I was, I was just curious, what is a, a marimbula? Marimbula? A rimbu marimbula. Well, I what is that? In effect, actually, what it is, it's, uh, it comes from the West Indies. And uh, what it is, it, it's, it looks like a large overgrown uh, box, and it has uh, slits in it, and it has four four pieces of uh, uh, described in there like uh, steel plates but very thin and they're tuned just like a string bass and uh, you sit down on a box and then you and you pull it pull at it with your fingers and the thing snaps and produces a sound and it, so it's a very primitive type of thing but it was used extensively in in the West Indies and certain effects that I wanted, I used that, you know. Um, with what other, I mean, you used some other kind of unique instruments. Um, I was on, on the back of the Best of album, um, Frank Kim. Frankie Kim. Right. Is, um, what instrument did he play? Well, he was the drummer. Okay. And Augie Cologne, that's when I added, that was the fifth, instrument that I added to the group, okay. with the, the drummer, and so basically my group was just five people. Yeah, Arthur Lyman played on, on your first album, did he? Yes. I know he, he later on went on. And second LP, it was Exotica 1 and Exotica 2. Okay. And then he formed his own group, and uh, he split in 1959, and was replaced by Julius Wechter. Uh, who later formed his own group called the Baja Marimba and uh, did most of the recording with, her, with Herb Alpert on the Tijuana Brass. Okay. Um, is Arthur Lyman still around? Yes, but he, is, he doesn't have a band any longer. He just plays vibes and he's, he works at a very exclusive club here called the Wildlife Country Club. And uh, he works there five nights a week and during the dinner hour he plays vibes. He plays four mallets. In regards to the, the album covers um, of your albums, most of them have uh, very beautiful women on the album covers. Uh, was there, I noticed that there was a couple that used the same model. Um, 
and most of them were designed by is it Pitté and Francis, Pitté Francis and Associates. Were they known? For, I mean, was, did they uh, do most of your album covers, and did they do anything else? I mean, were they known for anything well, else? The uh, the model on the, my first album and the first several albums was a was a very beautiful model named uh, Sandy Warner, and she uh, she modeled for approximately almost a dozen albums of mine, okay. and uh, she was so photogenic that she. Uh, she, you know, she changed her, her color of her hair, or wigs, or whatever, and uh, she, uh, a high identity, uh, a complete different identity, and uh, a lot of people, you know, associated her with my albums, but I, I had nothing to do with it. She was selected by the art department, and I did get to meet her some years later, and uh, it's kind of ironic that part of her career. Uh, was based on the fact that she was featured on my album cover. Did she go on to do other things? Well, uh, ironically enough, she recorded an album once, and she asked me, if they asked me to do the liner notes on it, and she sang, but I, I don't think anything really ever happened to it, and uh, I, I don't know whatever became of her. She got married, and uh, for all I know by now, she's probably a grandmother. Did, did you have any input on the album covers? At all? No, nothing at all. Okay. It's purely, it was uh, the, 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 the amount, the, uh, the design or preset by the company itself, which was Liberty Records. And uh, they, they have departed. Uh, the artist has very little to do with, uh, with unless, uh, unless he produces the, the recording himself, and then he can have some input. But when there is a different producer and everything, they... Uh, uh, they formulate their own plans. Did uh, with Liberty or slash Sunset? Did they put out all your records or most? Your, I know no, they put out about all. all of them. And then later on, of course, in years later, they were absorbed by Capitol Records, who own all my masters. Okay. Um, I know Cy Warnaker produced. Cy Warnaker at, at one time was the president of Liberty Records. And Al Bennett, uh, who passed away several years ago, uh, was the vice president, and eventually he became president. And uh, he made Liberty, he had a, uh, played a, a, a very important part in the development uh, uh, because it turned out to be one of the top record companies in the country. And uh, I'm very grateful to him because uh, he made it possible uh, for me to uh, arrive where I did by uh, uh, the popularity that I enjoyed, and he was largely responsible for it. Switch to the songs. Do you have any any personal favorites? I know you've done so many, but uh, do you have any personal favorites? Just out of curiosity, uh, that you've well, done. Well, you know, I've written a number of things, you know, and I, maybe I'm partial to the things I did. But uh, there were certain records, uh, certain albums that I did that some of the earlier ones uh, that. Uh, shows the origin of, of my style as it started to develop. And uh, I think one of my favorites is uh, uh, this one called uh, Primitiva. And the, uh, the other one was called Hypnotic. Okay. And uh, Hypnotic is the one that has the liner notes were written by, J by James A. Michener, the writer. <laughs> a very, a very glowing uh, article that he wrote for me. Um, right now, you you um, mentioned when when you wrote me that you're going to be that you have played Japan recently and are going to go back to Japan in the spring. Well, nothing has been uh, formalized, but I had a very successful tour. It's the first time I uh, appeared with my group, and it was an enlarged group. Uh, and I recorded here on the mainland, uh, rather in Honolulu, before we left, and they released the. Uh, uh, CD, my first compact disc in Japan, and uh, which was released this last May, and then uh, they sponsored me to come over and uh, to do five concerts. I performed uh, three concerts in in Tokyo, and then one in uh, in Nagoya, and one in Osaka, and they were completely sold out, and mostly by very young people who have discovered my music. What, what do you attribute to this uh, resurgence in your popularity? Do you well, the Japanese 
uh, you know, always curious about, you know, uh, new sounds, and they're picking up, a younger generation are picking up on my sounds. And, uh, we, uh, you know, uh, most of the things that, uh, that I recorded are, are really not dated, uh, because uh, if you've listened to some of the things I, I've done, I mean, they, they're sort of timeless. And uh, they're imaginative, and, uh, um, and people listen to it, and they always associate uh, the South Pacific or the Orient uh, uh, or, or Latin influence in it, which is very strong. And, uh, but they picked up on it, and uh, I was amazed because the average age up there were all the teenagers up to people are in their 20s. Interesting. Are you are you also gaining popularity in the U.S.? I would. Well, they just released uh, a new an album of mine, another CD. It's been released by Rhino Records, and uh, it's called uh, uh, Exotica of the Best of Martin Denny. And they what they've done is uh, reproduced uh, some of the earlier things that I did. Uh, I don't know whether you have. It. Uh, I've got a. I have this right in front of me, this new one that was released. Okay. It's called Exotica, the best of Martin Denny, which actually the title of it is the liberty release that I had, you know. Right. And, uh, and what's so funny, in the brochure, it's quite an extensive brochure, and they did they show the, the pictures of my first three albums, and they reprodu reproduced uh, about 20 selections. And some of the pictures of me that were taken 32 and 30 years ago, <laughs> I'm very young looking, you know, uh, very flattering, you know, I mean, there's, but there's a lot of water under the bridge. And uh, some of the things that uh, are repeated that are also that I've done uh, for Japan, like I've, uh, for some reason or other, they all want some of the old standbys, like I did the Quiet Village again. And uh, some of the some of the things that I did, are like Stone God and Jungle Flower and the Love Dance and uh, Exotica, March of the Siamese Children, Bangkok Cockfight, mm -hmm. African Titi Fly, uh, Martinique Tune from a Ragoon, Jungle River Boat. Well, anyway, uh, the Enchanted Sea. These are all some of the earlier things I did, and it, it, you know I find it rather amusing when I hear that because. I very rarely have, you know, played some of the things. I haven't heard them for years, and here they are. And so uh, this has uh, been released nationally in November. Do you, do you see a possibility of uh, touring the U.S.? Of me doing a tour? Yeah. I really don't know. Uh, if someone is interested enough uh, and ever comes around to it, I wouldn't mind doing a concert tour, but uh, I'm a little, I think I'm a little dated a little old to go out and do one night stands i'm not up to it do you are you currently playing in hawaii anymore? no 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 okay uh I, I you know actually i retired five years ago but i'm doing that but what surprised me they took me out of retirement and that's when i went to japan this year who who's currently playing with you who played with you in japan oh when i went the, the group that i took yes well when i recorded I, I, I used some of the original members of my group and other members who had played with me uh, on and off. I used uh, uh, Arthur Lyman and, uh, and Julius Wechter, both of them. I brought Julius over from Los Angeles. Wow. And it Harold Chang on drums. And he played, actually he played on my first recording of Exotica. And he had also appeared with me over the years and he also had appeared with Arthur when he had his group. And, uh, and another musician I had was Archie Grant on bass, and he had played with Arthur and myself as well. I had uh, uh, I had this Gabe Balthazar on flute, who had been the lead alto man with uh, Stan, uh, Stan Kenton for five years. Uh -huh. He's probably one of the most outstanding jazz musicians, and not only in Hawaii, but I guess in the country, you know. And I took him on tour, and then I also had uh, a very talented young man uh, who plays with the Royal Hawaiian Band and also plays with some of the top bands here. Um, 
emphasize and uh, his uh, Noel Okimoto is his name he's of Japanese descent and I used a guitar uh, and I, I used a keyboard for effects and I used a vocalist for the first time a young man named Manny De Los Santos he was 19 he just turned 20 beautiful voice and for the first time I used some vocal some of the things that I wrote for this album. Hmm. Do you have any uh, plans on uh, future records? Well, there's some interest. Uh, I have somebody in, in Japan who was responsible for me recording and going over there, and currently he told me he's working on a project uh, to bring me back there to do another tour and the possibility of us going to Shanghai, China. And uh, so how come... Of all places in the world, it goes to Shanghai and China. But he said there's a uh, they're they're going to have a, a sort of a international convention type of thing, and they they felt that that my music would be just ideal for that. I, I just I, I wanted to ask you just out of curiosity, how many recorded versions of Girl from Ipanema did you do? I know of two. I think I did two versions. Okay. Um, I, I I did one on a Latin. Uh, it was a Latin album. Right. And then I did another version on a go-go, I believe. Right. And that was it. Those are the two I'm... Sm I was just curious if you did more versions of that song. To but I also have a did, personal uh, favorite. Uh, I repeated some other numbers in, you know, same tunes, but gave them different treatment. Right. Like which, I, which uh, the... Yeah, the two Village, versions are very different. Go -Go? Pardon? I did Quiet Village again, Bossa Nova style. Okay. I wanted to ask you, on your letterhead, you hit, there was exotic, Exotica Publishing Company in Q. I have my own publishing company. Okay. It's called Exotica Publishing, but it is administered uh, by an uh, international pub, uh, overall publisher called Polygram. And uh, it, it's the main, uh, they originate in England, and it's one of the largest in the world. And they administer my, uh, along with many very well-known uh, publishers that they've, uh, they've collected. And uh, so uh, they're, they're pretty powerful because uh, one of their acquisitions, they bought the A&M uh, label, you know, it cost them five, $500 million. Mm -hmm. So you know it's a, it's a pretty strong company. What, what have you published? Have you published your, any of, anything that you've done on your... Well, uh, I got things published, uh, and I, uh, some of the earlier things I did were, were published by a, a firm called Criterion Music. And about, uh, they did about, oh, a half a dozen or more songs that I had recorded. Okay. And, uh, but most of my things uh, were released under my label that is under my publishing name. And that was what represented, you know, and by different uh, companies throughout the world. And then uh, QV Records is? QV it was, it stands for Quiet Village. Okay. I, I, re I produced my own piano album once uh, when I was over in Maui. And uh, so I used that uh, as my logo. QV is, stands for Quiet Village. And uh, so I, I did a thing called the Maui with Love. And, and it is all uh, leans towards uh, some of the compositions I wrote, but also has a Hawaiian flavor to it. 